Welcome to the NEPC webinar on the U.S. elections from yesterday. I uh, want to thank you for participating. Uh, it's uh, a time when we know you have a lot of options and, and prognosticators talking about what happened uh, yesterday into the, into the morning hours. So we appreciate that you're, you're spending part of your day with us. We don't expect this to be an overly long webinar. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, reflect upon uh, what's happened. I'll also talk about its implications for investors going forward. Uh, so in general, um, we're, we're not expecting this to be long. Uh, joining me, this is, sorry, this is <laughs> Chris Lavelle, uh, partner in client strategy, and I'm joined by Tim Bruce, partner, and Ian Spencer, senior research analyst. Uh, what we'd like to do today is to give a, a brief recap of the results, uh, talk through the potential policy initiatives that we see coming out of the elections yesterday, and the investment community reaction. You know, one of the things that you're seeing today is a lot of your managers are having webinars and, and having their internal teams talking about what things mean. We think an opportunity for NEPC in providing information for you is to try to summarize across the manager landscape uh, what folks are saying, and Tim will be here uh, to do that. We will have time at the end for questions and answers, and uh, if you've got any uh, questions for the panel, we'd ask that you submit them using the question pane. For those of you that are just calling in, I'm sorry to say, uh, we just have that option for questions uh, for this webinar uh, on, the, on this pane uh, if you're on the computer. You know, really the the idea behind having a webinar for this election uh, was about uh, the, uh, the positive feedback we got from our Brexit webinar, uh, which was a case where uh, we had a very unexpected vote. And in, in a short time period after that, within a, a few days, we were able to, to pull together a webinar, talk through the implications of that surprise vote. In this case, uh, we went into the elections uh, not expecting uh, as big of a, uh, a change as we saw. Uh, so we had the benefit of preparing for this webinar uh, in advance. However, um, since the uh, AP actually called the presidential race at, at 2.30 a.m. this morning Eastern time, uh, we've had less than uh, 12 hours to pull together what you're going to see here. And of course, you know, working with your consultants over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to have a lot more material there will be a lot more uh, uh, planning going ahead, and of course, we've got our year-end process where this will be you know, one of the factors that, that applies in, in looking ahead to our 2017 observations and actions. So with that introduction, um, I thought it would make sense because this has been such a big change in, in the last 24 hours to go back at what things looked like yesterday. Uh, while there was... Uh, uh, a few pollsters, uh, one notable poll uh, at the LA Times that, that has been consistently showing uh, the expectation of a Trump victory. The, the vast consensus of polls and betting markets has been uh, really, and we're going to focus here not only on the presidential race, but the important uh, uh, elections that occur in the House and Senate in, in terms of control, uh, party control. And, and the consensus yesterday so, so while people were voting, but before polls had closed, uh, it was about 80% uh, chance that uh, Clinton would be made president, 80% that Republicans would uh, continue to hold the House, and about 60%. So, that, so what was in play, perhaps, was uh, Democrats running the Senate. And, and under, under the view yesterday, uh, even a 50-50 tie in the Senate would... Um, would mean Democratic control because uh, they would also be controlling the, uh, the presidency and the vice president would be breaking that tie. Uh, we had uh, two presidential candidates that each individually had lower favorability than any past candidate since, since favorability ratings have been, uh, have been compiled. Uh, so much so that, interestingly, in the, in the last uh, few months before the election, uh, president Obama, who has suffered from relatively low favorability ratings for a, for a two-term president, has actually really been surging in favorability. And, and the comment that, that many people have said is, you know, compared to 
uh, the election we had, uh, you know, the president uh, looked you know, very presidential, and, and uh, uh, people looked favorably upon uh, uh, President Obama given the, the acrimony in this race. Um, in our white paper, talking about the election that we, we put out about a month ago, we talked about these sorts of odds. We talked about uh, you know, these issues. But we also drew out the point that we thought one of the bigger uh, factors, certainly the biggest factor that we've seen since the financial crisis, has been central banks and what the, what the Fed is doing with a raise in the federal funds rate expected next month. Uh, we really thought that that was uh, as material to the markets as what could happen in an election. And then finally, in terms of where we were yesterday, uh, we, we had uh, uh, a stock market that somewhat unusually had gone down nine days in a row uh, toward the end of the last month. Um, you know, not a lot to read into that, but in fact, at the beginning of this week, we had two updates going into the election. So uh, perhaps some concerns uh, by, uh, by stock investors uh, being assuaged a bit. So now let's look at the actual election results. Of course, I think everyone has seen this. I'm, I'm going to spend just a brief time on this. So uh, on the uh, presidential election, of course, it's, it's an electoral. Whoa, this is, uh, this is, oop, I'm sorry. I'll let me advance it one, yeah. So we, had, we did have the past, past uh, election in here to show how the electoral map has changed from the, from the previous election. Uh, but I, I did want to focus on, and, and we have some blank states here. So my, my home state of New Hampshire has not been officially uh, 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 solid as, as we, we go to print here. But uh, you can see uh, in the election, uh, uh, in this case, showing a slight uh, percentage in, by Trump in higher number of votes, although it's expected that Clinton will likely finish uh, very close, if not higher, than Trump in terms of the popular vote. The electoral map is very different, very different than, um, than four years ago. And we see states that have been uh, reliably blue or democratic uh, in, the, in the Midwest that have gone uh, to Trump in this election. That was really the story of the election for those of you that watched the coverage uh, last night. On, on past midnight was really these key states uh, like Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and then finally Wisconsin. That, uh, that led to the Electoral College win. In the Senate, of course, uh, only uh, one-third of senators are up. And uh, the, uh, oh, this is, <laughs> I'm sorry. So once again, we put this together on relatively short notice. OK, in the Senate, um, where, as I mentioned, the expectation was that uh, uh, we were going to see Democrats with a uh, slight majority. We actually do see now Republicans uh, again holding the Senate. Uh, there, are, there are two uh, potential uh, uh, changes here, but not going to change the fact that Republicans uh, look to uh, or have kept the Senate. And then finally, uh, in the House, we've got what happened uh, last election. And now what's happened in this election. And that's, I, I think, most striking because with, with all the individual districts, we get to see uh, how broad-based and, and how you know, the red is sort of shifted in this election. Having said those things and looked at the maps, we have some just quick observations. And again, comparing this to 24 hours ago, where we are today, uh, we did have the, the first party sweep since uh, Obama and the Democrats swept in 2008 in the midst of the financial crisis. Of course, divided government, having one or both houses separate from the president, is more common uh, post-World War II, about two-thirds of the time. Uh, the last uh, Republican uh, majority across all three branches, or the, the House, the Senate, and the presidency, was, was with Bush in 2002 and 2004. Yet having said that we swept at a Republican sweep, it was nothing like a typical coattails sort of sweep where a popular president will, will increase the votes of, of people uh, lower on the ticket uh, to, to sweep through. Uh, really, uh, as, as we all know, Trump's campaign uh, was very anti-establishment. And yet, uh, really, the, the 
victory of Republicans in the House and Senate is very much establishment players, people that, that uh, have been in politics. Uh, very few people around the country that identify as Trump that are new to this process as a Trump sort of uh, uh, representative. And so, and we even have the case where a lot of the senators that won on the Republican side distance himself from Trump in the weeks coming coming up to the election. So we're raising the specter here, and, and this is one of the dialogues going on, that we possibly still have a divided government. So even though the House, Senate, and the presidency are the same party, they're parties that, that think differently. So, so Trump, very much anti-establishment. Uh, we're looking to see Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, who uh, you know has distanced himself a bit from Trump, has had some words back and forth with Trump, uh, and is also a budget hawk, uh, very different from some of the things that, that Trump has said. Uh, we'll, we're looking to see if there will be a change in the Speaker of the House or whether they'll they'll come together, and then other groups of the Republican coalition uh, aren't really uh, much of a coalition, and the moderate Republicans. Uh, certainly did not support Trump, uh, or many of them did not support Trump in this election. And socially conservative Republicans uh, seem to support Trump sort of sort of late in the process as he talked about things like Supreme Court judges. Um, so interestingly, I, I mentioned Brexit and, and the similarities to what we saw in Brexit with an unexpected vote. Um, we saw in Brexit, uh, and we'll have some more graphs on this, uh, you know, sharp decline in markets after the unexpected vote, but very shortly within a series of days, and certainly by the end of June, we saw the markets recover. Uh, if you looked actually at the overnight markets at what happened in, in futures and what happened in markets around the world with this unexpected election result in the U.S., uh, we saw markets down about 5%, so a pretty substantive amount. Yet, as we sit here today, and, and the U.S. markets, even the, the opening of the, uh, of the markets here in the U.S. The market's been relatively flat and benign. So, uh, you know, one point that we'll perhaps come back to is that, uh, you know, one of the questions naturally is when there's such an unexpected outcome, what can you do as an investor uh, when, when things like that happen? And, of course, the markets adjust very quickly, and, and it looks like this could be a case where the markets adjusted, um, you know, through the courses of last night around the world, and now have already um, are already reassessing as we're doing today uh, what we can expect out of the future. Uh, one of the themes, of course, that, that doesn't perhaps hit investors that much is is pollsters and prognosticators missing. Um, and and really, this theme that we saw in Brexit of populism of of folks voting for for material change and kind of voting against uh, globalization uh, that started with Brexit. Uh, uh, can, can be one of the themes in a Trump victory. We're also looking to the uh, Italian referendum on the EU uh, on December 4th. And if this continues, it's, it's a very different sort of global world going forward uh, that will impact investors. I guess one of the other things about this is the market very much depends upon having good probability information about what can happen in markets. And, and I believe that we're going to see um, interesting developments in, in how polls are developed in, in how uh, folks do things going forward because there is a market demand for this information that's been failed uh, pretty fantastically these last two with Brexit and yesterday. Uh, we still expect the Fed to raise rates if we look at the CME uh, probability based upon Fed futures. It's down slightly from yesterday. It's, it's almost essentially where it was yesterday with about two-thirds chance of the Fed raising a quarter point when they meet on December 14th. So uh, many things have changed, but that part of the market, the idea that we are lower for longer, is still expected here. So I've given you some graphs, some, uh, some walls of text. Here's just a couple uh, comparisons or, or talking points about Brexit versus the U.S. election. And one of the things that happened at Brexit that I already mentioned is that uh, and stocks sold off, uh, certainly the, uh, the FTSE, the, the index for the UK, uh, fell off, but it but has since recovered. Uh, I mentioned what happened in the S&P, and we've got some changes there. So you know, Brexit was not uh, bad for uh, UK stocks generally, 
If you look at the lower chart, though, it was bad for the pound, for the currency of the UK, as, as they are uh, pending leaving the euro. Certainly different conditions with the UX, and we have a, a graph uh, in a little bit on, on what happened to the dollar. But in general, we would probably expect the dollar to uh, weaken after, after events like this, but then there's a, a, a circular path of currencies that uh, we'll be talking about, certainly when we go through our expectations for 2017, not today, but uh, as we prepare those. Uh, so I mentioned uh, what happened in the S&P 500. So what we have here in gold is what's happening in the futures market, which trade uh, throughout uh, the cycle. So you can see through the course of the election, I mentioned that AP called for Trump at 2.30 a.m., but futures actually bottomed out uh, closer to midnight uh, on Eastern time and then recovered such that at, at open, where we get the, the blue line from the S&P 500, uh, the market was essentially flat from yesterday, and it has actually gone up about 1%. So an interesting outcome. Um, in fears, uh, just like after Brexit, driving the market down, but then uh, in almost a return back to normalcy uh, that uh, you know, has happened in, in previous election cycles, as we mentioned in our white paper. And then finally, this is, this is a more difficult chart to read. This is a Bloomberg snap of, uh, of how markets stood just a few minutes ago. And we've already mentioned in white the, uh, the stock market up about 1%. Uh, the, uh, the dollar is, is the gold line is actually slightly up through the course of the day. That's a little bit confusing, uh, but one of the things that's happening there is the peso has, has traded off quite a bit, as you might expect. And then the final point here is what's happened to rates. So uh, the green line is, uh, is, is treasury yield. So that going up means that the treasuries are going down in price. And we've seen you know, the, the 10-year treasury, which is traded below 2% uh, for, for quite a bit this year, uh, has, has gone up, I think, more than 25 basis points during the course of the day. So these are the sorts of uh, building blocks that as we look to uh, delivering you our 2017 observations, actions, and assumptions. These are important building blocks that, that do uh, that, that this, the election then flavors uh, what the future can hold. With that, I'd like to turn over the next section to Ian Spencer, and he's going to talk through the policy initiatives uh, that, uh, that Trump has talked about and now working in concert with a Republican House and Senate and what they could be. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm going to focus on three areas here. We're going to talk a little bit about fiscal policy, a little bit about global trade policy, and then also a little bit about um, some of Donald Trump's comments about the Fed uh, and, and what that could mean for the relationship between the executive branch and the Fed um, and, and what the Fed does going forward. Um, you know, we're, we're limiting it to those three areas, understanding that that's not a comprehensive view of Trump's policies. Uh, we're leaving out a lot of stuff here, um, social issues, some of the bolder uh, claims that Trump has made. Uh, and we're doing that because, number one, uh, we, we don't have expertise to forecast the viability of, of some of those policy statements. Uh, and number two, the market impact of a lot of those things is unclear. So we want to focus on uh, fiscal policy and global trade because we think we have a better idea of what that means for markets and for economies going forward. Uh, and try to give some guidance in that regard. And so these next three pages are going to be structured with, on the top left, what is the policy that's, that's kind of being proposed or talked about? Uh, and this is, you know, taken from quotes from Trump or just straight from his policy statements on his website, right? So trying to take a nonpartisan look at, at what the actual policy is. On the top right, what's the viability of that policy? How does this get implemented? What are the challenges? Uh, or in some cases, you know, what, what's easy about implementing this? And then on the bottom, trying to look at the economic or financial implications of set policy. Uh, so starting with fiscal policy, um, you know, Trump is, this is one area where Trump is relatively in line with, um, with you know, a lot of conservative, or a lot of core Republicans, and that, uh, you know, his fiscal policy more or less boils down to lower taxes. Um, so some of the things that have been talked about are uh, reducing taxes across the board for all income brackets. 
uh, and then also a lower co corporate tax, tax rate. So Trump's proposal is to take it from 35% down to 15%, and then also eliminate the 3.8% that's associated with Obamacare. Um, so, and then, you know, down the line, there's also the potential that, uh, you know, a Republican Congress and a Republican president could work, work together to change uh, capital gains tax structure, although that's not something that's been currently stated by, by Trump. Um, so, you know, how does this get implemented or what's the viability of these things? Well, you know, as Chris kind of alluded to before, it's, it's more of a clear path. Yes, you do have some division uh, in terms of camps of Republicans, um, but lower taxes is generally something that they're going to agree on. Uh, so, you know, in addition with that, you know, Trump has gone through a few variations of his tax plan, uh, but his most recent one is actually pretty close to uh, what a lot of um, House Republicans have, have proposed as a, as a tax plan. And so we think that this is, out of the three things that we're going to talk about, kind of the most clear, the, more, the most likely to happen kind of early in a Trump presidency uh, for some form of tax reduction, uh, whether it be to consumers or, you know, to income tax or to corporations or, you know, likely both. Um, if everything aligns the way that we, we kind of think it will. Uh, so what does this mean for, for you know, for markets, for, for the economy? Uh, you know, support for increased consumer spending, more money in people's pockets. Uh, you know, in general, a lower corporate tax rate is going to be a, a, a tailwind for profit margins for corporations. Um, you know, there's still some valuation issues there. I'm not, we're not saying this is a very, very pro-U.S. equity story, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, but generally, these policies, if, if they are implemented and stated, uh, seem to be relatively supportive um, for higher prices for U.S. risky assets, i.e. equities. Uh, another thing that you know, this type of fiscal stimulus is supportive of is broader inflation. Um, you know, wage growth, things of that nature uh, should flow through uh, to some higher inflation. Uh, Chris alluded to this again before, but then it becomes a little bit of a cyclical um, you know, nature of then, okay, what does the Fed do based on the, those inflation numbers? And that's something that's probably a little bit further away um, just because of the, the way that inflation is, is observed and reported. Um, so moving on to global trade policy, and this is kind of, you know, I, I think you can think of this as a counter to the fiscal policy in a way, and, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, a lot of Trump, of what Trump has said is, is protectionist in nature. Um, you know, the idea of bringing jobs back uh, to his base. Um, and, you know, he has a pretty big base to answer to in that regard. Um, so we think there is, you know, some incentive for him to uh, stay true to his word, if you will. Um, you know, his vision, more specifically, is to negotiate what he calls fair trade deals. Uh, he's made some critical comments uh, about the TPP. Uh, we think that that's something that, you know, more likely, more than likely, will he'll withdraw from that agreement. Um, you know, this isn't a, a huge change. Uh, Clinton was one of the few Democrats who was broadly supportive of TPP. So, I mean, there are already challenges in place for, for that partnership. Um, so, we don't think this is a huge market-changing um, uh, policy, uh, but it is something to note. Uh, maybe of, of more more interest and, and more interesting is you know his pledge to renegotiate NAFTA. Um, that's something that could have a lot broader reaching effects. You've already seen the peso decline significantly um, based on some of his rhetoric around that. Uh, so we think that will be something to continue to monitor. Uh, similarly, he's, you know, Trump has made some very uh, aggressive statements about China, about our uh, trade policy with, with China, um, and, and that's going to be something to monitor as well. Uh, from an implementation standpoint, you know, these, these types of global trade policy initiatives uh, require less input from the legislative branch. So there's a little bit more autonomy here um, for uh, a Trump administration to negotiate these types of things on their own, uh, which we think is you know, kind of additive to the volatility or, or the range of outcomes, if you will, around these types of trade agreements. Um, I mentioned you know, the idea of, of a renegotiated NAFTA. The outcome of that is very clear. Um, you know, the, you, you've seen that Markets have moved initially, um, you know, to devalue the peso. But uh, long term, that that's something that's going to need to be reevaluated and reevaluated uh, as as we get more insight into that. 
Um, and I think you know more than anything else, there's just a broader um, kind of uh, tail risk event out there that that wasn't necessarily pre uh, present uh, had Clinton won the presidency, and that's kind of this idea that uh, if if negotiations with uh, with Mexico or with China uh, or with other countries begin to escalate, uh, you could have uh, a trade war by which um, you know China decides to further devalue the currency, be more competitive, uh, or something of that nature, and and that's kind of the the tail risk that we kind of see when we look at global trade policy and, and some of the things that Trump has proposed. Uh, so financial implications, you know, we think in the short term this is potentially disruptive to emerging markets. Um, a lot of the economies in the emerging markets rely heavily on, on trade with the U.S. Um, you know, we see that risk is probably less for, uh, you know, more stable emerging market countries like India, Indonesia, and probably higher for um, you know, like I said, Mexico and China, uh, which have been the target of a lot of, of what Trump has been talking about. Um, you know, in, in counter to what we talked about with fiscal policy, a lot of the protectionist policy that Trump's talking about is, is actually deflationary um, and would be more supportive of a, of a stronger dollar. Uh, so this is kind of something that we think is going to be important to monitor. Uh, we think that the mechanism for fiscal policy, for fiscal stimulus, is more clear right now. Uh, but a lot of that, you know, a lot of those benefits that I just talked about a page ago um, could get eroded very quickly, uh, you know, if there's complications on, uh, on global trade. So um, moving on, lastly, we've titled this Political Pressure on the Fed. Um, and this isn't something that, you know, if you go to Trump's website, he doesn't have a tab that, that drops down and says, you know, Fed policy. Um, but to our point about speaking to things that we think are going to have a broader effect on markets and are actually actionable, uh, we wanted to include this. So a lot of, a lot of what Trump has said um, about the Fed, especially more recently, uh, has been quite critical. Um, you know, he's called the Fed obviously not independent. Um, he's, he's accused them of creating a false economy, has criticized Janet Yellen for keeping rates, what he says is artificially low, um, and has even hinted that you know, when, when Janet Yellen's term expires as Fed chair in 2018, that he probably wouldn't renominate her. So um, from the implementation perspective, you know, this, is, this is well within Trump's executive power over time. Right? So uh, over the next 18 months or so, uh, after the start of his presidency, there is the ability to uh, nominate as many as five uh, federal open market committee members, um, which could slowly change the composition um, of that body and, you know, by proxy could change some of the policies that they decide to implement. Um, the bigger one down the road is obviously uh, Janet Yellen, whose term expires in uh, February 2018. Um, so that's something to monitor as we move along. Um, you know, in generally, what in general, what do we think about this? What's what's kind of the outcome? Well, the Fed's job is is seemingly a lot more difficult in a in a time period where the president is commenting politically on the Fed. Now, Trump could stop; he could not say another word on the Fed. Um, you know, between now and and the time that he gets sworn in, uh, and even continue that going forward. But you know, based on what we've heard, we're kind of entering a little bit of uncharted territory where policy for the president has been to more or less um, not comment on Fed activity. Uh, and, and if that changes, I, we think it drives uh, higher volatility for, um, for the Fed funds rate. Uh, they may be put in a position where they have to be more reactionary uh, rather than you know, current positioning, which has been to be very slow and methodical about what they're doing. Um, you know, so overall, we think, again, kind of tail risk here, but in general, uh, you know, the Fed's ability to remain apolitical could be challenged if, um, if the Trump presidency continues some of the, some of the comments and, and some of the criticisms of the Fed that he's, that he's had uh, lately. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Tim Bruce, who's going to take you through a little bit of uh, comments from uh, the, man, uh, the investment manager community and how they view this election. 
Great. Thanks, Ian. So we're going to change the lens a little bit and just look at it really from how this could impact your portfolio. Uh, so we're going to take really an aggregate, do a little meta-analysis of all of the stuff you've been receiving. I'm sure you received a ton of stuff from your managers. What our team has done is essentially gone through all of that stuff and provide some summary views uh, on, on how this could impact your portfolio. What we're going to do is really walk through three key areas. I'm going to talk about fixed income, I'm going to talk about equities, and I'm going to talk about emerging market implications. Um, in each of those three areas, the way the slides and the way I'll talk is structured is that I'm going to tell you really what was the consensus before election night, and then what is the view this morning. Again, summarizing all of the stuff that people were giving us today. So let's start with fixed income. So pre, how did it look? Little impact with Clinton. I mean, this was essentially consistency from Obama to Clinton, so there wasn't a lot of expectation of change. The one exception there was municipal bonds. This is one thing a lot of people have been talking about for six months, and that is with Clinton in play, um, there could have been a case of basically increasing taxes makes municipal bonds more attractive. Right? That's not happening today with Trump elected. So what does it look like post for fixed income? So post, deficit spending and fiscal policy have a real chance to push up inflation. So if you think of a lot of the rhetoric that you've heard from Trump, if he continues to kind of spend the way he's talking uh, for infrastructure projects, et cetera, and having a very strong fiscal policy, that's going to put pressure on, on ticking up inflation. Secondly, um, you heard from me in the move to replace Yellen. So Yellen's uh, term expires in February 2018, so the, the chance to replace that has, has real implications for, for what goes on in fixed income. And then finally, I would simply say that the tax reform fiscal policy that he's talked about so much, broadly speaking, what we're seeing from managers and, and certainly our own views is that this could actually be positive for fixed income credit sectors broadly. So I'll stop there and switch to equities. So what did we see pre? So U.S. elections usually have a very small market impact. We have some neat slides that people want to follow up with us that show this historically, but uh, in practice, U.S. elections really don't move equity markets that significantly. Um, in the gridlock, so again, pre-election, uh, the gridlock with a Clinton presidency is actually good for markets. If you think about this just intuitively, <clears throat> gridlock allows for lots of time for corporations and for the markets to digest potential legislative change. Um, and so that was the consensus going in. The sectors, if you looked at equity through a sector lens, the consensus before the election was essentially Clinton was bad for healthcare and bad for financials. So now we switch the page and look at post. Again, the tax cuts and fiscal stimulus that, that Trump proposes are actually good for U.S. stocks. Uh, so regardless of your views on Trump, a lot of the stimulus spending that he's talked about actually could really be a buoy for, for U.S. stocks broadly, and certainly some sectors like retail. Uh, secondly, post-election trade policy could hurt global equity. So I think a real distinction in our minds as we think about portfolios should be split between where we are in U.S. versus global equity. If you think about that, fiscal stimulus, a lot of the spending policy is great for U.S. stocks. The tariffs, the trade policies that he may implement could be really bad for non-U.S. equities. And so certainly an implication there. And finally, looking at sectors, if you think about uh, from a sector lens, where I said Clinton presidency was essentially tough for healthcare and financials, it was quite the opposite, I think, with Trump. So you have healthcare and financials and then added defense could be quite good. And finally, I'll wrap on equities by simply saying, if you just walk through the chain of events here, if you think fiscal stimulus is large, what follows from big fiscal stimulus frequently is inflation. Uh, if inflation comes and what happens, rates go up, which could put pressure on, on two areas in equities that have done quite well for a lot of client portfolios, and that is utilities and high dividend stocks. So I'll just plant that seed as a potential problem uh, for current exposures. And then finally, I'll go to the third of three things we're going to cover, and that's emerging markets. So pre, again, similar to U.S., if you look at the data, U.S. elections really have a limited impact on emerging markets, um, broadly defined, right? So yes, you have some volatility post-election, but within a 60-day period, a lot of that stuff settles out. So what does it look like post-election? Again, those protectionist policies that we talked about have a real effect on emerging markets. Uh, and so I think thinking about that through a credit lens, through an equity lens, et cetera, it's real pressure on EM. Second, the dollar, we, we have some slides talking about dollar volatility, uh, strength and weakness. The case for a strong dollar versus a weak dollar, we could talk about all day, but I think one thing most people certainly agree with today is that you're going to see some continued volatility in dollars. Why is that bad for EM? That's bad for EM because if you think about a lot of the economic activity, it's funded with dollars. So that has implications at the micro level on corporate spending and growth. That has implications on the policy level for emerging markets and how they actually finance activities. And so dollar volatility certainly is not good for non-U.S. emerging market equities. <clears throat> and then finally, the thing that obviously gets the most talk, and we saw it with the peso, is that these policies on, on trade deals, certainly wholesale dumping NAFTA, 
is a very real implication for Mexico. And Mexico being a sizable part of a lot of emerging market allocations, uh, from an index perspective, it could have real ripple effects in, in your exposure to EM. So with that, I'll stop, pause, and I believe we're going to turn it over for any questions that people have. Them. So um, we thought it would be useful uh, in the Q&A section to, uh, instead of just having a blank page that said Q&A, to uh, give you an opportunity to see some of the upcoming events that were in our uh, monthly client email. If you haven't seen these, uh, some upcoming uh, presentations, upcoming webinars that we'll be doing uh, that we'd love to have your participation in. Okay, so I'll tee up, Chris, I'll yep. tee up the first question that came through. So any immediate action needed from a broad asset allocation perspective? Yeah, we think the challenge for, for immediate action is that the markets do react pretty quickly. And, and Tim, you just said it. Uh, we showed some graphs on it. You know, there's, there's uh, volatility right at the beginning when something unexpected happens. And then there's an adjustment period. Uh, you know, we would make the, the, uh, the answer that I think a lot of people in the market say that there's going to be volatility. Because now we have, as Ian said, we've got you know, several statements from Trump that are, in, you know, conflict with each other that he said. And so those will be ironed out. How the governance model works with the rest of the Republicans needs to be worked out. And so you can imagine uh, particular days and weeks where there are contentious things going on and, and the markets will be more volatile. Um, but it, the, the challenge for that as an investor is uh, knowing that they're going to be volatile, knowing exactly when it's going to happen. You know, we are believers in, in having the opportunity to uh, to be strategic and long-term, but also the ability to, to have some tactical element. And this could be an environment where, where tactical implementations benefit. We don't think at the total policy level there's going to be a, you know, great opportunities to, to move because of this election. Uh, second one here. So these are clearly early days. When do you think we will see or have greater clarity on President Trump's policy initiatives? Well, Ian, I thought that was yeah, sure. I'll take that one. So, I mean, I think there's there's kind of three things you can look at in in the immediate. Um, you know, one is going to be if if Trump's going to forecast any cabinet nominations. I think that's going to be something that you can look at and and look at the types of people that he's that he's having for those, whether they're established Republicans, um, whether they're uh, you know business leaders, uh, the like. I think you're going to get better indication from reading into the cabinet nominations and, and what he talks about there. I think, you know, conversely, you can actually look at um, establishment Republicans and what they're going to do. I think, you know, somebody like Paul Ryan is a great example of, uh, you know, is there going to be this, um, we're, we're going to work with the Trump, Trump presidency or uh, are, are some establishment Republicans going to continue uh, with with kind of the rhetoric that they had leading up to their elections of, of kind of disavowing support for Trump. So I think uh, not, not just looking at him, but looking at how other Republicans react is, is going to say a lot about, uh, about his policy. And to, to, to marry that with, you know, some of the similarities we see with Brexit, you know, after the Brexit vote, David Cameron stepped down. Yep. So he, he said, I'll get the vote. And then once he got the vote, he stepped down from, uh, from leadership in the UK. So, you know, that's something that can happen here. Yeah, and uh, and I think um, you know we we always hear every election you know the hundred day plan um, for 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 each candidate and what that will look like. Uh, I, I think that is going to be especially important and especially accelerated this time around. I mean, at, at least all the pieces are theoretically in place um, for uh, at least on the fiscal side for for Trump to do something, and I think that will provide more clarity maybe earlier in his presidency than has otherwise been provided in others. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Any initial thoughts on the growth um, of U.S. deficit driven by the policy uh, and deficits by the Chris? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, I, I, I would say that the, everything that this speaks to is growth and deficits. I mean, when you talk about uh, you know, the largest tax cut you've ever seen, and you talk about uh, infrastructure spending, 
uh, and, and other uh, other spending that, that Trump has talked about. Um, you know, if all those things come together, that's just that's a, a massive amount of uh, of deficit spending. Uh, and to date, you know, uh, the, the deficit spending that we've done since the financial crisis uh, has been uh, sort of hidden by the fact that the servicing of the debt is cheap at low interest rates. So we saw the big increase in interest rates today. Uh, I know that um, uh, you know many uh, many of our clients uh, are, are issued debt, and uh, you know imagine uh, your your the rate at which you're issuing debt just overnight uh, went up 0.25%. Uh, it can it has a big impact, and so if we see uh, you know these things coming forward, as Ian just said, if if we have a hundred day plan and it's got uh, big tax cuts, big infrastructure spending, uh, that's going to to make the, the, the bond markets uh, very nervous and you're going to see rates go up and then uh, you've got a real challenge in servicing all the debt that, uh, that's out there. Okay, we have another question here on the DOL fiduciary rule and could this be in jeopardy? I guess it just raises a larger question on the regulatory action from, from the Trump administration. Yeah, so we didn't really touch a lot on, on regulations here. Uh, so we've had, um, you know, eight years of, uh, of Democratic administration in, in the executive branch and, you know, policy actions that have come out of that. Um, so, you know, this really gets to Ian's point on the cabinet because we don't know whether Trump is going to, to put in, you know, long-term Republican party people in those key executive roles and, and do the hiring that, that occur on the, the regulatory framework? Or is he going to have outsiders, you know, previous business associates, people that he knows in industry, and bring them over? I mean, that, that's unclear. You know, we didn't touch upon the fact that, you know, there have been other elections in other countries where uh, a, a business leader has come and said, look, I, I, I'm going to run the country like a business. and, and and those usually don't work out well <laughs> because the country is really not a business, and, and part of that is just the regulatory arm. So, so um, I'm not sure that I would say that, that any recent regulation like like uh, DOL fiduciary sure rule uh, could could come under scrutiny. But with that said, uh, if if uh, Trump and his administration address their concern to to one particular area, I think you have a, a chance of some major regulatory change. It's just really difficult to see where it would be. Okay, so the last question. Um, with greater uncertainty regarding President Trump's policies on trade and the possibility of elevated volatility, does this impact your views on active versus passive? Hmm. Yeah, so, well, so you and I both worked on this, but <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, look, the, the challenge with active versus passive, which we've written about and talked about a lot, has been I think, a number of things. But one of them, chiefly, was the volatile market, or the lack thereof. Right? If we talk about VIX, or we talk about complete lack of volatility in the markets, that's been brutal for active management. So for clients who have had a tilt towards active and paying these fees, it's been tough. <clears throat> in theory, in theory, volatility is great for active management, right, from really two different perspectives. One, it's good because if the goal is to have some kind of downside protection, active management continues to do that. It protects the ball, right? Protects on the downside. And the second one is that, look, you get this version, you get real volatility in the market. That's when active stock pickers can actually generate alpha. So I'm reluctant to say that it's fantastic for it, but in theory, a higher volatile stock market is certainly good for equities and good for, for active management. Uh, with that, uh, it's... Uh almost 245, so uh, we, we thank you for, uh, for participating with, with us today. Thank you for uh, asking the questions. Um, we, we truly appreciate the opportunity to, to work with you and help you achieve your objectives, and, and we've had you know, a number of uh, unexpected twists and turns, uh, uh, in not starting with a financial crisis, but certainly uh, during the financial crisis and since during this time we've been doing webinars. This is you know, a common time to be sitting and, and trying to assess. Uh, but please, we, we ask you to reach out to your consultants, uh, look for our, uh, our observations and actions for 2017, and uh, you know, investors have an important role in the markets to, uh, to look at volatility, look at, at 
unexpected things that happen in the markets, and then also to provide some patient capital. We, we consistently believe that that's a great role that we serve in the, in the global markets. Uh, with that, thank you again, and uh, we will be with you at the next webinar.